Welcome back to the Race Academy webinar series. We believe it's now episode series 19. So what a wonderful year we've had. It's been tough. It's been wet over here in Australia. Uh, a couple of months worth of rain, but um, nothing deters us from education and, and the academy moving forward. So today we've got a cracker of a topic, something that's been um, uh, requested, something that's been high profile in, in our laboratory and in what we're doing, and that's 3D printing. And there's no doubt 3D printing today is really the most prolific form of manufacturing. It's far surpassed the CNC reductive technologies and the accuracy that we're getting with um, companies uh, with um, the highest level of detail with their printers. And today we come live at you from a company in the States called Carbon. Carbon is without doubt the world leader in 3D printers. We're super proud to be part of their team. We're super proud to be using their technology. Um, with all the printing technologies that we've had, we've never found one to be so accurate, so reliable and so predictable as the relationship that we've forged with Carbon and their team. And it's uh, super impressive to see what Ellen and Joe and the rest of the senior management team over at the, uh, Carbon have done, the head office in Redwood City. And uh, today we've got uh, the um, Jamie Stover joining us today, and we're super impressed that he's given us his time. Unfortunately for day for, for uh, sorry Jamie, it's uh, it's eight pm at night, so he's just finished dinner. But he's very kindly decided to give us his time today to take us through a few of the bits and pieces that make carbon so good. A few of the bits and pieces that. He, that detail the reliability that specifically the DLS technology give us. Um, if there's any questions, as usual, we really love the feedback from you guys. Please feel free to add those in as you do, and I'll be asking um, those questions at the end to, to Jamie, and I'll vet those, and, um, and we'll ask him at the end. But look, there's no doubt Jamie is renowned in this field. He's been um, writing uh, all types of um, you know, magazines and journals across the globe. He's a master of transitioning workflows from analog through to the digital fields, uh, through both labs and clinics and, and other industries as well. So we're super uh, impressed to have him along today. He's got enormous amounts of achievements. I'm looking at a bio here. I'm not even going to start reading it. It goes for pages. But um, I just wanted to introduce Jamie Stover. He's a wealth of knowledge, and we're super lucky to have you on. Jamie, please take it from here. Well, thank you so much, Brad, and thanks to Matt and the whole team at, at Race. Uh, I, I can't say enough about how much I appreciate our partnership working with you guys and super excited to be here. And uh, like you said, um, it's it's eight o'clock at night. The, the funny thing is I'm on the West Coast of the U.S. I'm in Washington State. If anybody's familiar with the Seattle area, we're kind of famous for Microsoft and Starbucks and uh, Nirvana and Soundgarden. Um, but, um, you know, right, it's actually eight o'clock at night on Monday. And so when we get to the Q&A section, I think I'm going to ask you guys what happens tomorrow. That might be one of my questions that I ask you guys. So anyway, this is really cool. And I appreciate being here. And, you know, uh, we really can't talk about anything today unless we look at a statement like this from Elon. Um, you know, Elon is an outspoken uh, guy. And if you um, you might have seen uh, this podcast. I think this was maybe the first Joe Rogan podcast. He got himself in some hot water on that podcast. Uh, but um, this is this is true, right? We know that technology is changing very, very, very rapidly. And in the last couple of years, we've even seen more examples of that. So we're going to talk about that tonight, how that transition of our technology is getting us to a place in the industry where now we can talk about removable products being produced digitally where, you know, even just three, four, five years ago, it really was still just a concept. And we, you know, we know that uh, in the clinics, your technology is changing quickly and it's a lot to stay on top of. But what we're really talking about is we take for granted the fact that the fixed side of the industry, it went digital about a decade ago, right? And if anybody remembers those days, uh, I was a bench technician years and years ago when zirconia first hit the scene. And, you know, the mills were big and expensive. They were very inefficient. The aesthetics of zirconia looked like a piece of chalk, um, really strong, but not really very, very pretty. And now in the U.S. anyway, about 80% or 85% of the restorations prescribed every day are zirconia or zirconia based. So either like a full zirconia restoration or a layered uh, zirconia. And we just take that for granted. And now the removable side of the industry is getting its chance because of uh, you know, things like 3D printing and the materials that are associated with those. 
And it's going to happen. That transition, I believe, will happen much, much quicker than it did, than it took for zirconia uh, to start to replace and displace PFMs. And here's some of the reasons why focusing on what we're here to talk about tonight, specifically splints. Uh, this is from the ADA here in the U.S. Uh, survey. And I keep looking for a, a more recent one. And this is about the most recent one I can find. Um, probably because they saw what was happening and they said, we don't need to ask uh, clinicians that anymore. We can see what's happening. But 71% of clinicians about a year ago were saying that they were noticing a pretty, pretty good increase in uh, tooth and dentition damage from crunching, clenching and grinding, you know, the typical bruxism. We've known for a while, there's a certain segment of the population that they grind their teeth at night or when you're stressed during the day. But now we're seeing younger patients and patients that don't fit the typical demographic to need a night guard actually needing a night guard. So the need for these has never been higher, the need for night guards. We also have some other interesting industry trends and talking to you know, my friends at RACE and labs that we work with in Europe and all over the United States, I can tell you that worldwide, just globally in the dental lab industry, this is an issue. We have an aging workforce, especially the removable workforce, experienced removable technicians are starting to age out of the industry. And with them goes that knowledge, 30, 40 years of bench knowledge on how to do splints that fit correctly and how to do dentures and things like that. So it's an interesting time because along with a staggering amount of work coming our way in labs and a, a hard time finding experienced technicians, we're also, when we go to hire technicians and train them, we're also dealing with, and this is another global phenomenon that we're still seeing is staffing shortages, right? A lot of times dental labs, they will hire inexperienced uh, people who don't have any dental lab or dental experience. And they'll bring them into the lab and they'll train them up. And heck, I was one of those 23 years ago. That's kind of how I got started in the industry. And it's a really cool, it's a really cool industry because it is still an industry that you can get into with no knowledge and you can work your way up and have an awesome career, especially now with technology. But we're having a hard time because in my area, that, that McDonald's sign you see there in the lower right-hand screen, that's that's in the Seattle area. That that was taken about two months ago, that picture. Now that picture says $17.50 an hour. So $17.50 an hour US starting wage to work at McDonald's. Man, that that's making that's, that's really making a, a, a tight situation in labs for staffing. So if we take a look at how night guards are made. Here's the four main ways, and, and there, there could be you know a couple others, but if you prescribe a night guard today, send it to a lab, uh, just send it out to the universe. These are about the four main ways that they could be done, right? There's the traditional method, which I'm going to show you in a little more detail in just a second here. There's uh, the thermoform method where you basically pour a model or print a model from, a, from an enteral scan, duplicate it, and then you do like a suck down. And to me, thermoform, it is nice in a way that can be done a little quicker and they can shave some labor out for the lab. And that means probably can be sold at a lower retail price to a clinician, but they're not a comparison in abrasion resistance or durability as a traditional acrylic night guard. They're, they're really just not going to hold up as long. Um, I kind of think of them as like a really heavy duty bleach tray and there's nothing wrong with them. They, they, they work well, but they, they just aren't quite a direct comparison. Um, if you want to go digital, you can mill night guards and you can get a, a pretty decent fitting and a, and a, a pretty decent uh, milled night guard, one that will hold up. Uh, but the issue is that they're not really efficient for labs to produce. And, you know, anytime a product goes digital, usually the first uh, iteration of that will be uh, a reductive process like milling. And you start with a large mass of material when you're milling, you cut out just the pieces you need, the rest gets thrown away, or maybe a portion of that gets recycled. The other thing that happens in a lab when you're milling acrylics is you need to slow the speed of the mills way down. You can, you can spin the, the mills and the burrs and the mills pretty fast when you're milling a, a material like zirconia, it's a hard material. But if you try to spin the mills that fast with acrylic, you'll actually start to melt the material. So you gotta slow the spindles down and those mills means the two uh, night guards that you see here in this puck take somewhere maybe between an hour and 15 minutes, maybe an hour and a half to mill these two night guards. So not real, efficient for labs, uh, considering that they can have zirconia in those mills and be producing a lot of zirconia. And, and that's important to dentists and to patients because the quicker that we can get products produced in the lab, the smoother the workflow is, uh, the, the, the smoother, the, the less appointments required or, or the less, you know, the time between prep and seat. So we really want to keep these things moving. But when we go to an additive process, you're not starting with a large mass of material, you're starting with a pool of resin. You're creating these products out of the pool of resin, super efficient. 
Uh, for an example, you can, you, can, um, you can print, and I'll show you this in a little bit later, but you can print about 10 night guards on the printer that Race has in the same amount of time that you can mill two that in this picture that you can see here. So super efficient. And what's great about this is, yes, it's a digital process, but the lab is leveraging its experience in the digital technology and these amazing machines to bring you and your patients these benefits. And you don't have to change anything you're doing. And I, my older brother is a prosthodontist and I, I've spent lots of time, you know, working with him and we worked together for a long time. And so I really understand looking at, uh, you know, anytime we're going to change a product or a process for a clinician, it can mean something different than a lab, right? You can have to retrain your staff or you can have to buy a piece of equipment sometimes. And with this, that's not the case. You just keep doing what you're doing. If you're taking digital impressions, that's great. You send race your, your digital impression. They can create a, a, one of these printed night guards that way. Traditional impression, they're going to they're gonna pour a model and scan the model, or they're going to scan the impression in some cases. They're going to digitize that, and they're off to the races producing that night guard. So you don't have to change anything you're doing. Super strong and abrasion resistant. Um, you know, it's called key splint soft, but I'm going to show you. This is not a soft night guard. I'm going to squeeze it here. So it's got a pliability to it. It's a thermoactive material, meaning that when you put it in warm water, you warm it up to body temperature in your mouth, it has the comfort of a hard, soft, like a dual laminate, but it does, it's a monolithic. So, you know, the thing about those dual laminates is they're nice and comfortable, but that inner liner always delaminates and comes out and they get gross over time. And this is a monolithic night guard. So you don't have to worry about that. So super comfortable patient compliance is, is really high. Uh, they don't end up on the bedroom floor in the morning. They end up in the patient's mouth because they, they, they like them and they'll wear them. Um, you know, the digital production, it's really helping us in the labs. It's, it's helping us move these products from the bench where they're produced uh, traditionally to digi the digital uh, workflow. And that's really helping us mitigate that shortage of technicians and, and meet that crushing work that's coming our way. The digital record, I cannot say enough about, you know, about 98% of the time that a night guard needs to be remade, it's why? Because a dog eats it, right? A dog eats it or it goes down the garbage disposal, gets left wrapped in the napkin and thrown away. And it's funny to talk about the ways that these night guards can, can uh, you know, disappear. But it's not funny is you got to start all the way back over from scratch when you're a clinician, get that patient back in the chair. And with this process, race once they produce one of these key splint night guards, they store that record on file. So if the dog eats the night guard, you simply call them, they pull that, that file from their storage, they put it in the next printer build that they have, they print it, they finish it up and they send it to you. And um, we can talk about that at the end. I'm sure you might have some questions about how that works. We can talk to, talk to Brad about that, but this is, uh, this is a really, really, really nice benefit. And we talk about also new products and you hear about this and you go, that sounds great. Maybe I'll wait a little while until some other people have tried them. But I'm going to tell you, this product has been available in the States for over three years. And according to Keystone, the uh, company that makes this material, there's over 2 million. And that's a very conservative number, but over 2 million of these in the mouth um, worldwide since it's, since it's launched. So we're way past, way, way past the guinea pig zone. Just our customers alone, we, we watch metrics and um, just our customers alone, we've seen a 70% increase in this over the last year, printing this material. Talking about how it is a viable product with abrasion resistance. And this is a really interesting chart. This is from Keystone, the company that makes this material. And you can see um, these key splint that comes in a couple different iterations, a hard and a soft. And if you look at it on the list compared to some of these other acrylics that you might recognize, and then let your eyes wander over to the right-hand side of the screen and notice that uh, these key splints were tested at double the test cycles in most cases as these other ones in the test. So 400,000 test cycles versus 200,000. And you see similar abrasion resistance and similar um, material loss, or in some cases, less material loss than some of these other products on the market. So again, been around for three years now, over 2 million in the mouth. And you know, the studies uh, here that you can see, uh, it's, a, it's a very robust material. We talk about dogs. We talk about how night guards get eaten by dogs sometimes. This is my dog. And I'm going to tell you, he's a golden retriever. If you know anything about these dogs, or if you have one, maybe, or know somebody that does, they're great. They're, they're really good family dogs. He's about five years old now. And uh, <laughs> the thing is, is he eats anything and everything. And throughout his life, he's eaten pillows. He's eaten stuffed animals, blankets, towels, you name it. Uh, there was a time where he got onto my bed and I had a pile of laundry. I had just dumped from the dryer, you know, clean laundry on my bed. And he, 
somehow he escaped and got into my room and he decided to eat a sock. And you can see on the right-hand side of your screen here, that's what it looks like when a sock, usually what will happen is a dog will eat something, it'll bunch up in their stomach and one way or the other, it's gonna come out in a couple of days. Um, this case, you can see the sock went in lengthwise into his small intestine. It was not coming out. It was about a $2,500 surgery. Uh, but I did say that the vet was able to save the sock for me. That's a, actually a picture of the sock right there. I still wear it. Uh, it's the most expensive socks I, I, I'll probably ever buy. I probably never buy socks that, that expensive. So, Hey, why not? Right. It's a little keepsake. But anyway, I thought what would happen if I tried to give my dog a key splint night guard? So I, I thought I'd show you guys, this is interesting. Check this out. So the jury's out. I think he would have eaten it if I threw on the floor and walked out, but I was hoping that I could, uh, you know, shoot some video to show that these were golden retriever resistant. And then I was going to go to Keystone and say, Hey, you know, why don't you give me a little backside piece of the action? Because I proved another benefit of these things. Pretty amazing. But I think he would have eaten it. Do you? So let's take a look really quick, traditional night guard fabrication, and then we'll compare it and contrast it to how we make these. We'll talk a little bit about 3d printing. And then we'll be uh, heading in. I'll show you a little bit deeper dive here in a minute of what this looks like. But, you know, we talk about if you haven't been to the lab for a while and seen how a technician makes a traditional acrylic night guard, there's a lot of steps. First of all, you need a technician who really knows what they're doing with their hands. You can see this is an excellent technician. They're using a wax spatula to create the, the, uh, the night guard, getting the occlusion dialed in. And then they're going to take that and their um, wax up and they're going to invest it in a flask, kind of like a denture, very similar to how you do a denture. You're gonna boil that out. You're gonna pack or press the acrylic. And then once that flask cools off and the acrylic's cured, you're gonna break it open like you see here. And there is a night guard. Now the fun begins. Now we get out the heavy tools. Here comes a chisel. This is how night guards also meet their demise sometimes is death by chisel right there in the lab. And then you start back over, but you gotta destroy one of the models that you created. And then you're gonna put it, uh, after you chisel the stone out of here without breaking it, you're gonna put it back on the model that you duplicated. And then we start grinding. And you go, well, why, why are we grinding on it? Because no matter how good of a waxer you are, you know, there's gonna be variances in thickness. And we're gonna dial the occlusion back in because there's things like expansion that happens, uh, expansion of the stone or expansion of the acrylic through the, through the process. So um, I, I ended up somehow in my life with a lot of, uh, my friends are engineers. And engineers talk about something called copy error. And I don't know if you've heard about that, but an engineer will tell you that copy error will, will creep into a process. The further and further you get away, the more steps in a production process, the further you get away from that, in our case, that initial impression, the more room for copy error to fit in. And that's why even if you're working with a, an excellent lab like Grace, you know, there's times where you'll prescribe a traditional acrylic night guard, you'll get it back and there'll be some adjusting. And we really see less adjusting with this digital process because you're cutting out so many of these steps and so many of these opportunities for copier. Let's take a look at a little video here really quick that shows the production of a key splint night guard. <laughs>
anytime I see that, that video, I, I just get this visual in my head of like, you know, the, you, you see those videos back to back. The first video, it's like you're driving around in a 1950 Chevrolet farm truck or something. And then you park it and jump into like a 2022 Tesla, right? It's just the workflow is really that that night and day, isn't it? So I want to talk, spend a couple minutes here just talking about 3D printing because we, we hear a lot about 3D printing in the world and it's kind of a mystery uh, how it works. And I'm not going to get into really into the, the weeds on this. If you focus your eyes on the right hand column, the far right hand column, that is what the majority of dental uh, printers and dental lab printers are today. So we're going to focus on that category and we're going to talk about how it works. And in a nutshell, DLP and, and DLS, it's uh, it's it really what it is, is you have basically a piece of glass and that piece of glass forms a, a vat that you pour your resin into. Underneath the glass, you have a light source. It's a UV light source usually. And then you have a build platform that lowers into that, that vat. And, you know, it's if you think about when we design, there's the CAD and the CAM, right? So the CAD is the design part. We're going to design a night guard in this CAD software. And then there's the CAM part where the CAM software slices that design up into a, a bunch of tiny slices. And it, think about it, if like if you go to a movie and you watch a movie and you, you're just watching the movie play, but if you were to go up into the projector room and pull that reel off, there would be a bunch of individual frames. Well, that's, that's the same way that this is. The, the CAM part is like those individual frames. So what happens is you have a part design and the um, CAM software will play one slice or one layer of that part uh, via the UV light, it will shine through the glass and it will partially cure that resin to that glass. And the build platform will pull that partially cured resin off the glass. The, the light will play the next slice and so on and so forth until you build your part. And so traditionally years ago, DLP printing was not really efficient for dental labs because it produced parts that have this layer by layer kind of wafer cookie approach. It was a slow process. The, the finish of the, of the parts weren't very smooth. You kind of had ridges on them and it just, we also had a real lack of materials. And so uh, at my company, the founders, the co-founders of Carbon realized that, well, UV light will partially cure resin to the glass. Oxygen will inhibit that partial curing of resin to the glass. So they designed a very special piece of glass. It's actually two special pieces of glass that are oxygen permeable. We pump oxygen up through that glass and what happens then is that part can't partially cure to the build platform. And so as the build platform raises off in conjunction with the UV light, new resin flows underneath um, very quickly. And what you're seeing here on the left-hand side of your screen is not real time. This has been sped up. This is an air vent that's being printed. And this is you know sped up just for the purpose of this. But you can see how, and this video here demonstrates a little bit closer when we look at it under uh, extreme magnification, you can see the 3D printed part above the oxygen permeable window there. And you can see what we call the dead zone. And the dead zone sounds kind of uh, a little bit ominous, but actually the dead zone is where all the magic happens because that's the area that the resin cannot cure to that glass. And so new resin continuously flows underneath. And we get parts that have different mechanical properties. You can see the right-hand side of your screen. That's a DLS printed part, like the, the same printers that Race is using. And you can see that the it doesn't have that layer by layer horizontal kind of wafer cookie build profile. Our build is almost about a, at a 45 degree angle. It's a much tighter grain profile. And you can see that the strength of the part can be affected with a traditional printing method, depending on how you orient the part when you build it. And it's just not affected that way with the DLS technology. So it allows us to print some pretty interesting uh, structures like lattice that typically need um, much different supports when you when you print them on traditional printers. Lattice allows us to replace things like foam. And so if we take a peek over our fence and we get out of our, our backyard, that's the dental industry, and we look at other industries that are being disrupted by 3D printing, it's really inter interesting that again, these same exact printers that Race has are used by companies like Adidas, Rydell, and CCM, um, specialized in, in uh, physique for, for bike saddles. So you can take, you can scan a, a runner's foot if you want to, you can scan a runner's foot and you can produce a custom tuned midsole where it has this lattice midsole. And instead of needing an insole for arch support, you can just beef up the lattice in that section and, and you can help to correct 
uh, you know, arch deformities and things like that. There's also just an off the shelf version that you can buy. That's pretty awesome. Um, in, in, uh, the NFL here in the United States, uh, right. is a company that produces helmets for the majority of the NFL teams. And you can scan a player's head and you put a reflective, uh, hood on, you scan the player's head and then you design these custom lattice pieces that fit inside that helmet and they're finding lattice. I mean, it's, it's hollow, so it's cooler. It's much more comfortable and much better impact absorption. Specialized, same thing for bike seats. There's actually a process. I talked about scanning runners' feet, scanning football players' heads. There's actually a process for cyclists where you can you can do a scanning process. I haven't had that done myself. I do have one of these seats, and it's pretty awesome. I like to ride mountain bikes and road bikes. And uh, but if you're a cyclist, definitely <laughs> definitely look on the specialized website and check this this out. And then also in the automotive industry, companies like Ford and Lamborghini. Uh, are using um, printers to put 3D parts, uh, printed parts on production vehicles. They're just finding it to be a much more efficient process. But what I'm most excited about is where the future is going to go, bringing it a little bit back closer to what we do in the medical device space. They're talking about designing resins that are bioabsorbable. So you could, you know, conceivably 3D print a part, maybe like a heart stent, and it wouldn't have to stay in the patient's body. You know, the, the, the artery could heal around the heart stent over time. And then that material could just dissolve and pass through the body without a trace and not have to stay in there. So companies like Moderna, Johnson, Pfizer, you know, Johnson and Johnson and Pfizer, these companies that have become household names for obvious reasons over the last couple of years are also looking very hard at micro needles. So if you've heard about micro needles or you haven't, you might want to check it out because it's pretty interesting. You can 3d print these little patches of micro needles. I'll show you what they look like here in a second. And you could conceivably do them with dissolvable tips. <clears throat> so you could load the medication in an dissolvable tip and it could, you could inject it under the patient's dermis and it could disperse its medication and then dissolve and pass through the body without a trace. Or you could coat <clears throat> these micro needles with something like a vaccine or any type of a medication that needs to be administered in multiple doses. This is a really interesting study here by the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. This is a 3D printed patch of micro needles right here. And what they're finding is that if that they think the future of vaccines and, and other medicine delivery could be micro needles, because if you inject the vaccine just under the dermis, you get a much higher immune response than if you jab a needle further into the fatty tissue. And they're also finding that if you use those micro needles to inject the vaccine uh, in the mucosa, you get an even higher immune response than you do in the dermis. So why is this really exciting? Because you think about the, the mass vaccinations that we just did worldwide. And you saw the roadblocks where lines of people we had to figure out who could get vaccinated first. Healthcare workers had to get vaccinated, right? And you have to be trained to, to give somebody a shot. You don't want to be putting a shot into somebody's vein or artery. And with microneedles, the idea is that maybe patients could even vaccinate themselves. Healthcare, healthcare workers could vaccinate themselves. Just take the pack of microneedles and you do that and you're effectively could be vaccinated. So really, really exciting. So 3D printing, we're talking about, it's really exciting to talk about these splints and, and some other things that um, that race is doing. It's, it's awesome in our industry. It's game changing. It really is life changing. But overall, 3D printing is disrupting the way things are made worldwide. Uh, NASA even has the same printers that race does to put um, 3D printed parts on their little spacecraft that float around up there like a little uh, robotic inspector. So pretty cool. Bringing it back down to earth. It's not just about splints. Race can produce anything that you see here on the screen with their printer. So traditional, traditionally produced products or, or, or fabricated products like surgical guides and even, you know, some castable materials, impression trays, um, some pretty awesome dentures, which we're going to be talking about. Uh, spoiler alert. I think we're going to be talking about dentures in another month or so here. But um, anyway, lots and lots of, of products are now being uh, created with 3D printers. I'm going to look at the workflow here really quickly, and then we're going to move on to the Q&A. So just we kind of watch that video and it kind of gives you an overview of the workflow. I'm going to move through it here again. I can't stress enough. It doesn't matter if you have an interoral scanner or you're still taking traditional impressions. Either way, you can take those, you know, bite records traditionally. You can you can take traditional impressions or you can use your interoral scanners, to scan the patient's mouth, and you can send the files to race, you can send the impressions to race, and they can make these either way. So nothing you do clinically has to change. You just have to request that you want one of these night guards and they can, they can do it for you. Um, so if you take an interoral, if you send an interoral scan, they're gonna import that scan into their design software. And that's what you're looking at here on the screen. 
or they're going to uh, pour a model and scan the model or possibly scan the impression, depending on what they're doing with their workflow. And, um, and they're going to import that. And now they're off to the races with a 3D model. And, you know, one question that may come up, hopefully somebody didn't already ask this. I can't see the questions yet, but we'll, we'll get asked, you know, what kind of night guard designs can we do? Can we do a flat plane occlusion only, or can we do a ramped occlusion? And the answer is really whatever type of design you would prescribe for a traditional acrylic night guard, race can do this for you in the digital world because they have all the tools in the digital software that they have on the bench. And what you're looking at here on the screen is a picture of a virtual articulator. So you can even, once you scan this model and you can even set up the occlusion correctly um, on your choice of articulators, the software has these articulators in, in there. And so really tons and tons of tools and options available to these technicians. Um, once they design them, they're going to nest them. So the CAD part again is the design. The cam is the nesting. So this is a picture of about 10 night guards uh, nested on uh, one of our carbon printers build platforms. And you can see some estimates on the right side of your screen there. And you can see that these 10 night guards are going to print in about an hour and 39 minutes. So that's very close to that time frame I was telling you back at the beginning of the presentation when we can do about eight to 10 night guards in the same amount of time printed that we can mill a couple of night guards. So there's that efficiency right there. Also nice thing to note here is it shows you the required resin volume and then the part and support volume. And so what happens is if it doesn't use, you need, you need more resin than the parts are going to create a uh, need to create these night guards. And at, at the end, when after race is done printing these, they can take this, this build plat, this cassette off the printer and they can put it in a special stand they can pour the, uh, the leftover resin back through a filter into the jug and reuse it. So it's a very uh, efficient and not a very wasteful process. Uh, another interesting thing to note here, not being too geeky, but you can see the night guards are kind of in the teal color. And then you can see kind of a purple lattice or mesh structure. That's a supporting structure that race adds to these. And it, it keeps them oriented at about a 40 degree angle. So it supports them during the print process. During the print process, there's quite a few forces. There's compression and suction forces that happen during the print. And if you don't have the parts supported correctly and even oriented at the correct angle, then those can those night guards can distort and, and not fit very well. And so this setup here allows you to print a lot of night guards um, in a short amount of time and have them fit like a glove. So pretty, pretty cool. So here's a picture of um, once you have them nested, you're going to be dispensing the resin. This is a really good picture on the left-hand side of the screen of our, our special window, the cassette that has uh, the oxygen permeable glass you can see there. Fun fact, uh, at Redwood City, California, where our printers are, are, are built and assembled, there's one room in, in our facility where these windows are manufactured. And the last I heard, there was only like four people in the company that have access to that room. So if you talk about the secret sauce, I think that's a pretty secret sauce. Um, you know, you can you can be back in the area where they're assembling printers and stuff and you can see the room, but um, you don't dare go into the room, I guess. So anyway, you, you dispense the resin, you print them. And then uh, after they print, you just take a spatula and you remove them from the build platform. Pretty, pretty simple there. And you can see now that that purple mesh that was represented as purple on the screen is now a clear mesh support. You want to remove that. They're connected with a bunch of little tiny dots. So it's almost like undoing a zipper or tearing an envelope. They just pull right off. Super simple. You put them in isopropyl alcohol, wash them for about three minutes in the shaker table and wash the uncured resin off the surface. And then you swab out the intaglio and then you do one more wash in isopropyl alcohol for about two minutes. You just want to get all that, that resin off the surface and off, out of the inside of those night guards before you put them in the cure box, put them in a UV cure box. Special cure box is hooked up to nitrogen. So this chamber is filled with nitrogen while these cure, well, after they, they cure them, they polish them up and they are um, ready to come to you and to your patients. And they look, they look um, very similar to what you see here on your screen. So that's about it. I think I wanna move, I wanted to make sure I moved quickly enough that we could get some time for Q and A. I'm gonna wrap it up here. Um, I really love, Again, bringing it back to that first slide where we're talking about evolution, we're talking about change. I love what Henry Ford said, and, and others have echoed the same sentiment over the years, but I love what he says about change. We, we know this is true. If we continue to do things the way that we have always done them, we're going to continue to get the same results. And, and 
and throughout our, our time in dentistry and in the dental lab industry, we've seen these products come in and really be game changers. And I'll tell you, this is, this is one of them. And uh, I, it's just, it's, it's been such a game changer for, for labs and for a lot of reasons. And what I like about Henry Ford's quote is that he said this all those many years ago about his company. And today, a couple of years ago, actually, his company was the first automotive manufacturer in the world to put 3D printed parts on production vehicles. And they did it with a carbon printer, same printer that Reese is using. So pretty, pretty cool tie in there. Uh, oh, if you haven't seen the evolution of a dental lab technician, you're going to want to pay close attention to this. I like picking on lab technicians. Here's the first day in the lab. Here's about 15 years in. And here's what we can look forward to in about 30 years. I, I have a theory also that because now that we're, we're starting to bring digital technology into even more of what we do in the labs, we can start to reverse this aging process. So stay tuned over the next couple of years and we'll see if we can start to change these pictures and maybe we can start to be a little better looking in the lab industry. But anyway, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for uh, paying attention. Hopefully that was um, informative and fun. And um, here's some references. If you had any questions about anything you saw, any statistics I showed, any of the studies, any of the, the, you know, the quotes or anything, it's all right here. If you wanted to take a look at that or screenshot that or and the team at Raise can provide that to you if you had any questions. Uh, thank you so very much. And um, I think it's time to maybe chat a little bit, Brad. Yeah, Jamie, mate, again, firstly, thank you. I know that was a presentation that you were a little rushed on, uh, asking you to just get it out a little bit quicker for our viewers to be able to uh, enjoy their lunch as well so firstly thank you your knowledge is unsurpassed and um to see the amount of detail and and um the the, the what this company your company has built in in the, what's relatively short time is real, a real credit to you and, and your team um we do have a couple of questions so i'm going to jump straight in there um the first one comes in from uh, dr david cox you legend cotty what would you prescribe for a night guard doubling as a retainer um, Brad, I mean, I, I, so I'll defer to you on a lot of these. If you have anything specifically you want, you want me to answer, Brad, you let me know, but I, you know, I'll, I'll love to hear your thoughts on that jumping right off. Oh, look, and, and it's a question that a, a lot of our clinicians ask, um, can, and we get a whole bunch of times that if we're abusing aligners, can I bleach teeth in aligners? Can we prescribe things that work as doubles? Um, look, I think it's a real clinical question, um, and a good question. Um, as a dental technician, we specialise in, in manufacturing um, by prescription from what the clinicians want. Um, so I guess I, I'm, and as a Crown and Bridge and Implant technician myself, Dr. Cox, I would be probably more happy to ask you on your recommendation for it. Uh, but what I will do is, is find that out and get back to you. I don't want to, uh, to give our viewers a, uh, a bum steer. Um, we do have people from all over the Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, the US, uh, and I know there's a lot of people watching now, so uh, I'd rather find that out and, and post that when this video goes live, uh, as I don't know, to be honest. Um, another question here, Jamie, my patients all believe the printed night guards from Race are more comfortable than the milled splints. Is this due to the material being softer and thermosensitive? Well, it's a good question. I, I don't know exactly, uh, just... Being totally honest, I don't know exactly what material that um, uh, race is using to mill. What I can say is, you know, you're dealing with some geometries and you, you eliminate some of those funky geometries when you print. Uh, when you mill, you have undercuts and you have burr compensation. You have some things that you have to make adjustments for uh, because that burr has to get in there and cut out the inside and the outside of a night guard, quite frankly. And when you're printing them, you know, you don't have a lot of those same limitations. So it, it, it could be a mix of the manufacturing method just being a, a little bit easier uh, to, to deal with some of those geometries and engage some of those undercuts a little bit better from printing. And it could also be the fact that it is a material that's, that is thermoactive. And so when it does warm up to body temperature, it becomes very pliable and very comfortable. But I'm, I'm really glad to hear that you, you and your patients echo what I've heard so many times. So it's nice to, to hear that. Brad, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but that's yeah, that's, no, well, that's uh, that's all good. I've got questions pouring in. Actually, I've got people jump, jumping on now for questions that uh, that missed part of the um, 
part of the show, Jamie, so I'm just going to continue on here. We understand printed prostheses are far better than anything traditionally manufactured. When do you think you'll be able to print mouth guards? Oh, boy, that is a good question. And I can tell you our, that's one that our company is really interested in. I know worldwide that's an application that's really popular. It really comes down to the material and, and material development, being able to find a material that's printable and, and gives all the same uh, material characteristics of a, of a traditionally fabricated mouth guard. So I would say that's on the product roadmap. I, I wouldn't dare say when, um, but th that's definitely something that we are very interested in. Um, yeah, well, uh, that's a big question down here, Jamie. So uh, anything you can give us uh, as soon as you can and be good. Obviously, we're launching our printed dentures and there'll be a live presentation on that on the Academy series coming up. Um, Professor Michael Stubbs has requested, he said, fantastic presentation, Jamie. Really enjoyed to see how the splints are made in the laboratory. Uh, is there any alternatives to the key splint material in colour, e.g. clear over blue, etc.? Yeah, so there's there's two iterations of the key splint soft currently right now. There's a key splint soft clear. Uh, this that's the one that I was showing you earlier. The you know the the pretty durable one. And then there's a there's a key splint hard. The key splint hard right now is available um, only in a in a tinted version. It's kind of a um, almost like a light uh, bluish version. Uh, but Keystone is developing that as well in a clear. So I'm told any day now hopefully within the next month or so, we should be able, you should have, uh, Ray should be able to get the material in, in that clear color as well. So, uh, but for carbon exclusively, and I don't know how long it will continue to be exclusive, but um, when this material is brought to the market in a collaboration with, with carbon and Keystone, uh, the clear material was available only on a carbon printer. And so uh, hopefully that didn't, Hopefully I did uh, less to confuse you than to answer your question, but it is available in both a clear and a tinted. Um, currently race can, can print the, um, the key splint soft in a clear and, and the hard and a tinted and, and hopefully very soon they'll be able to print the hard and a clear as well. So, Yeah, look, Jamie, look, that, that's fantastic. We have, like I said, we've really enjoyed the partnership with you, your company, and particularly your printers. Um, our team enjoy using them. They're far easier to use. They're far more predictable to use. The failure rates that we used to get on, on printing platforms has pretty near diminished uh, in entirety. So, um, yeah, that has decreased the amount of grey hair that uh, our team here has also um, been given. But, look, um, like I mentioned, we'll be using these printers to, to launch the, the printed dentures. Um, particularly looking forward to the softer opportunities down the track, which I know Carbon and their research and development team are working diligently towards. Um, I was shocked to hear that our printers are able to support NASA, so I'm looking forward to, to doing that. If they ever need to land down under, we can support them at any time. But, uh, look, um, on behalf of the, the Race Academy team, Jamie and, uh, and people from all over the Asia-Pacific and US and Canada, uh, here I've just got uh, news that there's participants from all over the place that signed in to watch you today. Uh, from all of our uh, our panellists, our guests, questions, Professor Stubbs and, and uh, Dr Cox and others, so I appreciate your questions. But is there anything that you'd like to leave us on, Jamie, something you think we should know or look forward to or, or something you can see us out on? I know, I know our viewers are keen to know what's coming from Carbon, so if you could give us a bit of a snippet on the way out, mate, we'd love you. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, just thank you so much to everybody in attendance. I really appreciate your time and thank you, uh, Brad, and your entire team. It's It's been awesome. And I, I, I think I'm coming back in, in a, about a month to do talk about uh, some printed dentures. If I didn't screw this up too bad, um, then I think I'll get a chance to come back. And so hopefully I'll be able to uh, talk to you all again. Um, I will leave you with, um, yeah, material development is, is something that we are, you know, it's, it's paramount for us. This same, this is kind of exciting is the same company Keystone that makes these these uh, the material for these night guards. We uh, announced a few months back that we have an exclusive partnership with them to produce and develop a 3D printed uh, flexible partial denture. And so that's pretty exciting. Um, that's in the works right now. They have one of our printers and the, the materials and the, the samples are going back and forth between the companies. And we hope to have some big news on that later this year. So, um, you know, flexible partial denture printing would be pretty amazing. I think you'd probably agree, <laughs> agree with that, Brad. So that's, 
that's a little peek into the future. Um, lots of other exciting, exciting things uh, coming, but that's, that's about the only one I can say that won't get me in too much trouble right now. So. Oh, look, that, that's wonderful news. And look again, mate, I know it's late for you. You've just finished dinner. Your dog's probably in there chewing on your socks right now. I hope, <laughs> I hope you can get back there in time to get it done. But I want to thank my team, um, the sales marketing director and, and Janelle and, and what she's done for the, for the Academy series at episode 19. We're looking forward to bringing you back for, I think, 20 or 21, mate. And we thank you for your time. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We look forward to seeing you all in the next episode of Race Academy webinar series. Thank you all. Enjoy. Be safe. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you.